thank you everyone and welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight on the core volunteer training, which is our weekly program at Citizens Climate Lobby that provides CCL supporters with access to in-depth training and opportunities on topics relating to climate change um, and effective climate advocacy. So I'm your host, Sarah, I'm filling in for Brett C. tonight. And tonight's topic is progressive outreach um, with some updates and suggestions from Stephanie Doyle. So first, I wanted to introduce our Speaker Stephanie Doyle. Uh, here's a fun picture of her with our CCL Advisory Board member and former West Wing actor Bradley Whitford at the, one of the most recent CCL conferences. Stephanie serves as our Director of National Outreach and Partnerships in the DC Office of Citizens Climate Lobby. And much of her work involves building relationships and engaging with other organizations and NGOs to coordinate efforts on carbon pricing and climate policies at the federal and state level. Her outreach work also involves enhancing CCL chapters' abilities to partner and coordinate locally with other environmental, and particularly those that are on the left of center, business and NGO groups. Stephanie's undergraduate work was in biology and marine biology, and that sparked her interest in climate work. So she recently completed her Master's of Science degree in Energy Policy and Climate from Johns Hopkins University. And she's also an avid scuba diver and dog lover. Her dog Darwin is the cutest. Um, and when she's not in the office, she's usually out exploring with him. So on tonight's call, we're gonna cover three main points. Um, so this training highlights recommendations on communicating, communicating with progressive groups about the Energy Innovation Act, reviews the organizational statements made on behalf of the recent legislation, and walks through CCL's ongoing plans for outreach to progressive environmental and climate justice, justice organizations on the national and local level. And to do that, we'll go through this agenda. First, we'll go over the national support, what CCL is doing, how we communicate with progressives, how to respond to criticism, helping with local outreach, and we'll end with a Q&A. So. so yeah, thanks for everybody for being on here. Um, I am happy to get to talk to you all about my work and about what CCL has been, um, what discussions we've been having. Um, so I first wanted to just go over some of the statements that we've gotten from other national groups about the recent Energy Innovation Act. So a lot of these um, aren't endorsements and I can sort of go into some of why that is. Um, but really a lot of the bigger environmental organizations don't feel the need to pick one uh, specific policy right now they're really waiting to see kind of what ends up coming out um, and they sort of see picking one as um, just it, it limits them um, and that's really what makes CCL unique is that we picked one which has really enabled us to kind of hone in on that um, but that's why we haven't seen some of the bigger organizations putting out endorsements um, but they have put out some really great statements and quotes um, and you can find more of them than the ones I'm going to go over here on the energyinnovation.org um, website. Uh, and there's new ones going up all the time, um, so I'm happy to, to answer questions about those. Um, but some of the ones that came out that we thought were really impactful and can really help when you're having conversations with um, progressives uh, are some of the ones that are shown here. So the Nature Conservancy, um, said that a bill like this is a necessary component of any effective plan to address climate change. David Roberts at Vox said the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act is a credible, ambitious climate effort. Taking innovation seriously means instituting a rising carbon fee. And EDF um, said the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act adds to the growing course of support for meaningful action to protect our country and the planet. Um, and so these are just really helpful. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about using trusted messengers. Um, these are just some other ones that you can use, but really thinking about how traditionally CCL focuses a lot on trusted messengers that tend to come from the right, just because we, we need more of those voices. Um, but when you're giving a presentation or you're talking to people on the left, you really wanna focus on making sure your trusted messengers are people that you, know, you trust and that your audience is gonna trust. So that's a few others. Sheldon Whitehouse said, virtually every serious economist who has considered the challenge of reducing emissions from the right and the left agrees that setting a price on carbon is the most efficient solution. Indeed, the IPCC in its latest report said a carbon fee is one of the best tools we have to prevent catastrophic climate change. Jim Hansen said the bill gives us the chance to fight it seriously and on a big scale, I encourage everyone to support the Bipartisan Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. 
and then NRDC who actually put out a great blog. They have a really long um, piece on the bill where they model it out as well, comparing it to some other ones. Um, they said the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act reflects a serious effort to respond to the gravity of the climate disruption we are already experiencing and that will only worsen if we fail to act. Most importantly, it is sponsored by both Republicans and Democrats. So those are just some of the statements. Um, like I said, there's new ones coming up all the time. There's quite a few from faith organizations, which tend to have a lot of sway with progressive groups. Um, so I would, I would just recommend checking that website. Um, you know, even every week, there usually tends to be at least uh, one new statement that seems to go up there. Um, and again, those are different from the endorsements, which we have on the, a separate page, um, but those statements can be used they can be just as useful as endorsements in a lot of ways. Um, so I just wanted to touch a bit about what I do for CCL on a day-to-day -day basis and really what we're working on at the national level here in DC um, to help bring more groups and more attention to the to the new bill. Um, so I we CCL sit um, at a number of tables and strategy groups in DC. So there's lots of different groups of groups that meet to talk about strategy, um, to talk about policy. Uh, and we sit at a lot of those tables and I'm usually, I or Danny are representing CCL. Um, so we are working with other groups, um, especially around the Climate Solutions Caucus. There's a robust group of organizations that work on that. Um, I continue to meet with representatives from groups that, uh, who haven't been supportive uh, and try to figure out ways that we can move forward, whether that's them not being opposed or finding kind of what the, where the differences lie between what would get them to support a bill. So maybe um, if it's an organization that cares about labor, they wanna see something in there that addresses labor. Um, and so I do spend a lot of time speaking with these groups and really figuring out where those additions or subtractions may come in, in later iterations of a bill that would garner more support. We also have multiple members of CCL that um, are part of the US Climate Action Network. So USCAN is a giant group of groups, um, mostly left of center organizations that work on climate. Uh, and we meet pretty regularly to work on all sorts of different topics, um, but we, there's at least three or four CCL staff that sit on those meetings and um, work on building our relationships up with other groups, uh, work on not just the Carbon Fee and Dividend Act, but really uh, helping think through the larger strategy of the climate movement, um, as well as thinking through um, other topics that can address climate. Uh, and then I just wanted to mention that groups who are quiet, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, and what I think is really nuanced about a lot of what we're seeing now around the Green New Deal and some of these other, um, the, the, the noise that climate is getting now, which is fantastic, is that there's a lot of political posturing going on. And CCL is really unique in that we're nonpartisan. We sit in the middle. We really are one of the few groups that have good relationships with people on both sides of the aisle. Um, and so it's important to remember that at the moment, Sometimes groups not being out and supportive of the bill is not necessarily a bad thing because we are still trying to build up that support on the right. Um, so an example might be uh, National Sierra Club, them coming out in support of the bill at this exact moment wouldn't be extremely helpful, mostly because they don't have a good relationship with Republicans um in at the national level anyway not necessarily at the local level so it's just something to think about how we that there's strategy that we're taking into consideration as we work to build the coalition out eventually we need everybody um, but there is some sort of there, there is some thinking that you know we have to be careful with the groups that we're working to get support for um, because of how polarized our our climate movement and the Climate, climate world is right now, which is really unfortunate. So how do I talk with um, progressive allies about the bill? Uh, so there's gonna be some examples that we'll go through here, um, but I wanted to go through some opening considerations before, and these aren't even just about the bill, they're more about um, how you should be thinking about interacting with groups um, in general, uh, especially progressive groups. So the first really important thing to remember is that relationships matter. So you really wanna think 
of any conversation is opening a door rather than winning a debate or being right. Um, there, you know, I, I think this a good example is how we think about when we meet with members of Congress. We don't usually start unless you, you know, have a really great member. You're not starting with asking for them to support the bill right off the bat. Or if you are, you're not expecting that that may be the first thing they agree to do. You build up to that. You get to know the staff. Um, you build up that trust. And we really need to think that we really need to remember that doing that with other organizations is just as important as doing that with your member of Congress. You really want to focus on a shared vision for the future. So even if we in the climate movement can't agree on how we're going to get there necessarily, everybody agrees where we need to go. Um, and that's one of the really important things that I have realized make a conversation initially start off a lot better is instead of trying to argue about what the pathway is that we're going to get there, really hone in on what those values are for why we're all fighting for this carbon free, free, carbon free future. And it's really an effort to build up that trust and to recognize that, and I'll go over this in, in a, a couple of slides, but that there needs to be lots of different strategies to how we're going to solve this problem. Um, and I do find that acknowledging that we're all going towards the same end goal is a really important way to start those conversations. A really important one is to not assume that carbon fee and dividend is the best or the only solution. It sounds really simple, but being humble and really acknowledging that uh, a carbon price just in general is a first step um, will go a really long way in your conversations. Rather than trying to beat someone over the head with policy, you really want to talk about that we acknowledge that this is part of the solution to a huge problem that is not going to be solved with one tool in the toolbox or that it's the best solution. We just think it's a tool that will make a lot of the other solutions easier uh, and it's the one that we have dedicated our time to spending on but that doesn't mean that we don't uh, see value or want to work for other solutions that are out there. Again, and, and then again, when you're specifically working, if you, if you are specifically working on climate or environmental justice groups, um, I really recommend that you join our climate and environmental justice action team because there are a lot more nuanced conversations that go into that and it really takes a deep dive to learn about those issues and that topic um, before you can really go out and do that work respectfully um, and, and well. Um, and our team is really incredible. They've spent a lot of time thinking through the messaging um, and how you really want to be interested in someone. We don't want, like I said, you don't want it this to be like a bad first date where you only talk about yourself and we don't ever ask groups what they're working on. What can we do to help you? CCL has some incredible resources. We're really good at helping other groups with even just basic lobbying um, helping a group find a venue. There's a lot of different ways that you can work with an organization without necessarily talking about the bill. And for some groups, we're never going to agree on this on the way to get to the solution, but we can still work within the climate movement to better each other and bank on each other's resources. Um, so it's just something to remember that um, yes, we want to be talking about the bill, but that there is some nuance to that, especially when you're working at the local level with um, other climate organizations. So when you do talk about the bill, and again, um, like I said, this is really nuanced work, uh, and I don't, I don't expect that everybody will figure this out right away. I'm happy to always talk with you about, you know, if you're doing a presentation, how you should approach that. But it is really important to remember that our bill is really progressive. Uh, it is extremely progressive. It creates jobs and it protects people through the dividend. It saves lives through health impacts. Um, it is really effective at cutting emissions and it has the support of those trusted messengers that I mentioned before that you really want to uh, remember to make sure you're using the right trusted messengers when you're giving a presentation to a progressive audience. Um, and we're making a new slide deck that will be available on community where it will have different slides with quotes from trusted messengers that you'll be able to just pull out the slides that you want or need for presentations. So hopefully that will help um, really back up uh, what we're saying with, with again, those elite cues and those trusted messengers, because it really does matter um, who groups are hearing information from. I think most of us have seen that in the media and everything in politics nowadays, but it, it really is an important thing to keep in mind. So this is some 
these are some of the examples of the trusted allies um, that have spoken in the past about carbon pricing, not about our bill specifically. Um, but even just talking about carbon pricing is a great way to bridge a lot of that uh, value system and try to build up that trust with organizations. So um, Barack Obama, Bernie Sanders, the Pope, Bill McKibben, um, all of these people have said positive things about carbon pricing in the past. Um, and you should, again, you should really try to focus your messaging from these people when you're speaking to progressive audiences rather than showing Bob Inglis or, um, you know, someone from CLC. Uh, they can be useful in some contexts, but we really want to focus on building up that trust and people trust who they identify with. That's just um, part of our, our politics these days. So these were just some of the quotes um, Bernie Sanders had said, I'm proud that we introduced the first piece of climate change legislation, which called for a tax on carbon. Um, he has introduced carbon taxes almost in every Congress. Uh, Barack Obama had said, if there's one thing I would like to see, it would be for us to be able to price the cost of carbon emissions. Uh, and the Pope had said only when the economic and social costs of using up shared environmental resources are recognized with transparency and fully borne by those who incur them, can those actions be considered ethical. And uh, this is a quote from Bill McKibben just about working with CCL. Um, and again, we're going to have um, more recent quotes uh, up on the website so that you can be able to go grab these and use them in presentations. Um, and then these are just some examples of bills that have been introduced by Democrats. Um, so this is really helpful when you're talking to audiences and they say, well, you know, who supports this in Congress? Here are some great examples. So these are not all like our bill. Many of them are cap and dividend. Some of them are cap and trade, um, but they are all some sort of price on carbon. And you have a wide range, you have, um, Representative Beyer, Van Hollen, Larson, White House, um, both Senate and House. And I find that this is also really helpful when you're talking to groups about sort of the range of what bills can look like. Um, if you're finding that groups are pushing back on our specific bill, you can walk them through, you know, that there are other examples out there and that maybe we can talk through what it is you like about this bill versus ours. Um, I've just found that reminding people that this is not a new issue, it's not a new policy solution, this has been around for a really long time um, and has the support of almost every single Democrat, probably every de single Democrat in Congress right now. Uh, and that that is, that, is a, that is a really important message to make sure that we're giving to our progressive audiences. So now we're gonna go through some examples um, responding to criticism of the bill. And then there's a bit about the Green New Deal in here as well. But before we go forward, I wanted to give some context that, that I find really helpful, which is this Bill Moyer's Four Roles of Social Activism. So I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but um, we've been working on it a lot in US CAN, where there's tons of different climate groups that work on climate change from very different angles. Um, and it's really fascinating, Bill Moyers, so that he has these four roles of activists, and then he also has this incredible graph that shows like when during the process of social movements do you need each of these roles in order to get to the end goal. But so the different roles are the advocate role, um, which focuses on communicating with power holders who can change policy or practice. This is also called the reformer. Um, there's the helper or the citizen role, which is somebody who does direct acts or they're serving as sort of um, normalizing the subject. So normalizing that climate is um, an important topic. You can think of groups sort of like climate reality who go to just educate people. They're thought of um, a bit as that one of those roles. The organizer role. Um, so this is change agents, people who think big picture um, and really work to uh, get people together and and organize basically. And then the rebels who are seen as those that really are out there in the streets, drawing the media attention and bringing new people to think about the, whatever issue it is. Um, you need those people that are, are loud and kind of you know out in the streets. So CCL really sits in a few of these, but mostly the advocate and the helper. So we do a lot of we're seen as a reformer. We work with the system, we work with the politicians we have in power, um, but we also work to make climate normalized um, and to bring new people to the subject 
we don't really do much rebel work at all. Um, groups you can think of like that are Sunrise, Greenpeace, um, and it's really important to remember that we need all of these if we're going to get enough groundswell and enough political will to get an actual climate solution passed. Um, and I have found that talking through these roles and thinking about them, um, and Bill Moyers does a good job of pointing out like what makes a good advocate versus um, the mistakes that an advocate role can make and a, the mistakes a rebel role can make. And really looking at those and talking that, with, talking that out with other groups is, is a great way to understand that there's an ecosystem that we're all working in and that CCL serves this very specific niche in there. Uh, and we're needed to stay in that niche. So one thing I, I like to say is that we get told all the time by other environmental groups that they understand that somebody needs to be working with Republicans. They don't wanna do it, but they're glad that we're doing it. Um, I get told that semi-frequently by other big environmental groups. Um, and so there is an acknowledgement that, that there needs to be groups playing that role of bringing Republicans along, even though some of the groups are uncomfortable with it. They recognize that if we're gonna get something passed and it's gonna be durable, you need groups that are working on that at the ground level and at the congressional level. And I, I, I would just, I say this all to, to say that if you're having trouble with somebody who's extremely progressive or who doesn't understand our work, explaining how we sit in this unique niche within this greater ecosystem, I find is a really helpful way to have a deeper conversation with somebody um, rather than just fighting over policy details. So I'm going to go through some examples of criticisms or concerns that may get brought up um, and then some of the responses that we've used um, or that you should think about using when you're when you're responding. And obviously this is, again, this is nuanced. You don't need to always use this. You should use your best judgment um, or call me. I'm always happy to help think through um, if you're having an issue at the local level or at the national level, um, always happy to talk through it. Some of the concerns that we hear, are, we're running out of time to solve the climate crisis. We need more than just a price on carbon. Um, and this can't be the be all end all solution. So ways you can talk about this is we don't really have time to wait for Democrats to control every part of the government. If you really think that climate is as big of an issue and as immediate and as urgent as you as many people say it is, then getting anything, even a, just a first step solution in place now should be a good thing. And that's how CCL thinks of it is that um, while we can still push for all of those other changes that we'd like to see, we also wanna operate in the now to make sure that we're trying to get the most emissions reductions as soon as possible. Um, and this differs a bit from other groups' theories of change. Other groups really are thinking five years, six years out, um, as when they see the possibility of really being able to enact something. And CCL just doesn't, we don't really want to wait that long. Um, and being able to talk that, about that we can, again, we can aim for more emissions reductions, we can aim for stronger justice policies, better adaptation measures, and just transitions, while we're also working to put a price on carbon that will make all of those things more likely and easier to push forward. And Tony wrote a really good blog piece, there's a link there, um, that really talks about the bill and how progressive it is and how fast it would work and a lot of how it plays into strengthening a lot of the values and goals that um, many of us share with, with our progressive ally friends. So another concern that gets brought up is that this policy will hurt low income communities who already suffer the worst impacts of climate change. Polluters will continue to pollute in these neighborhoods unless they're stopped. So it's really important to acknowledge that that is, that is true, that low income communities do suffer the worst of climate change and environmental pollution. And then acknowledge that our policy will reduce pollution in low income communities that is related to fossil fuel production and combustion, which is a significant source of health impacts. Um, there's still a lot of science or political studies and modeling being done to see where, which plants would get shut down first, um, which are legitimate concerns but raising the cost of pollution is going to improve health and uh, air benefits for everyone immediately regardless, because coal goes away first and foremost, which is the dirtiest form of energy. Another concern that gets brought up is that the policy will hurt people who are employed in the coal and oil industries, and there's no plan for a just transition for them. 
So a good response to this is that we support job retraining for all people employed in endangered industries. It's not included in this bill, but we would be supportive of money allocated by Congress for this priority. Um, so I think a lot of groups think of CCL as this really dogmatic and we're very strict on what we ask for, but we really are more flexible than I think we give ourselves credit for. Um, and really our bottom line is that we want to reduce emissions, we want to protect those lowest income and not the frontline communities, and we want to make sure that whatever passes is bipartisan so it sticks and it lasts. Um, and so I think it's important when you're, when you're talking to groups that when they bring up a concern, you can share that with me and with our DC team. We really are trying to work to figure out where those push and pull additions and subtractions in the bill are going to be. This, you know, the bill is gonna change over the years. Um, whatever is in there now will probably not be the final version. And so we're working now to understand the concerns of groups, um, to find out what it's gonna take to build that coalition and you having conversations about that will only help us as we start to navigate that. So another concern that gets raised by progressive groups is that clearly this is policy is bad because it's supported by Republicans. Uh, and like I said, today, I'm sure you all are deep in this, but politics is really polarized right now. Um, and this is what I was talking about, some of that signaling from groups that offer support. Um, it's really tricky to, to navigate some of that pointing out that a lasting solution to climate change deserves and needs to be bipartisan uh, in order to be passed before 2020 and even after 2020 uh, and to survive intact when majority party leadership changes. So, so this is one of the trickier subjects to, I think, talk through with groups. And again, it sort of depends on how politically involved they are. And most organizations recognize that you are going to need some Republicans to back whatever climate policy is out there. And when you really get down to it, um, we don't have to convince all of them. We just need to convince some or most of them. And that is really what CCL is good at. Uh, and pointing out that we have a Senate that's controlled by Republicans right now. Um, and pointing out that you, we ha we're gonna have elections forever. And that whatever we put in place shouldn't be a political football it shouldn't be this thing that gets that has the potential to get repealed. And the next one is clearly this policy is bad. Uh, clearly this policy is bad because oil companies are supportive, who are happy to pay a tax, which they will pass on to consumers and continue doing business as usual. So the answer for this one that we use is that oil companies know that climate change needs to be addressed. They prefer a predictable, transparent, market-driven solution that allows them to plant their businesses to an approach that chooses alternative energy winners. Oil companies cannot avoid the carbon tax, but they can innovate low carbon sources of energy. So again, this is a trickier one. Um, there's progressive groups who don't wanna see oil companies get any benefit from a transition, um, which is understandable. They've been, some of them have been deceitful. Um, but I, one of the things that I think has, I found is useful is pointing out that oil companies employ some of the smartest people. They hire thousands and thousands of workers and to not try to use some of that intelligence and the infrastructure that they've already built to make this transition quicker is just gonna make everything take longer. Um, and again, you can also point out a difference here between our policy and the Climate Leadership Council, which I know we sometimes get confused with. Um, our bill does not give any liability protection to oil companies um, and we probably would not support that in any bill. Um, and I do think that is really where a lot of progressive groups um, are concerned is that they want to be able to make sure that if and when it's shown that oil companies were deceitful, that they can pay for some of those damages down the road. So the next one is the policy won't work because this approach doesn't guarantee emissions reductions, we should use regulations instead. Uh, and a good answer for this one is that regulations are most effective when they're focused on a specific industry, not focused across a large number of industries or economy wide. Because of carbon price, because carbon is so pervasive throughout our economy, a broad tool like our policy is simpler, easier to implement, less expensive and more effective. We do still see a place for regulations, but regulations cannot replace the broad impact of a carbon price. Additionally, this policy allows for an increase in the fee in the event that the emissions targets are not being met. Word for word, you're gonna to need to be more nuanced with some of this depending on the groups you're speaking to, but hopefully there's nuggets in here that you can pull out and find useful. Um, the next one is the policy won't work because it will push us towards fracking. Um, 
And for this one, pointing out that the electricity sector is already moving away from coal to natural gas because of prices without, even without a carbon price, and that carbon pricing will accelerate that transition from natural gas to renewables faster than most other approaches. Um, and this, our policy does allow for regulations to continue on fracking and on, and on methane. And then lastly, just wanted to touch on the Green New Deal. And if you guys have more questions about this, I know it's been um, a big topic lately. I'm happy to answer them. Um, but talking about how this policy relates to the Green New Deal. So the Green New Deal is incredible. It's exciting. It's moved the conversation in a way that we haven't seen in years. It's bumped climate up the list of priorities for Democrats uh, and Republicans alike. Um, and there's this idea of the Overton, Overton window where if the left moves further to the left, we, we're, we're already seeing that it's sort of forcing the Republicans having to address, well, if you're not for the Green New Deal, then what are you for? And they're gonna have to start answering that and coming up with solutions. Um, and the hope is that they will move towards a more market-based price because it's the opposite of a Green New Deal. Um, and so if you get asked, you know, can it include a carbon tax? Yes. Of course it can include a carbon tax, but you really don't wanna be forceful or try to change the Sunrise Movement or co-opt their policy. Sunrise Movement is doing incredible work. They are very focused on building out the support for the uh, resolution that's been put out and the principles, um, but we don't want to be forcing ourselves uh, upon that. We don't wanna force our policy. Um, what comes from, the Green New Deal is, is yet to be seen. And I think a lot of uh, members in Congress are also recognizing that it's gonna be a lot of different bills that get put forward. Um, and one way to think of this is think of as creating an inside and outside pressure. So I was talking before about rebel groups like Sunrise, they are out there putting the pressure on members to do something. And then you can have groups like us who are going into meetings and can have more of those policy discussions of, if you're ready to think about what a solution could be, here's one possible option that that could be, which is our policy. Um, and we really want to remember that these are not competitive ideas. We don't want that narrative out there that it's a carbon tax or the Green New Deal because they're not comparable. Um, a green, the Green New Deal is the framework that will be filled in with policies. A carbon price is a tool that can be used to meet that framework, um, but it's, it's not the only one. And if your member of Congress asks about it, you can bring up that a carbon price it can, can definitely be a part of a Green New Deal um, and that it's part, it should be part of any climate, solute, climate legislation um, specifically as quoted in the IPCC reports. So closing considerations, just reviewing some of what we just talked about is that you really wanna be centered in CCL shared values. So you really always, always, always wanna be respectful appreciative and full of gratitude for other organizations as they're doing this work. Um, we are lucky that the climate movement has such incredible groups working from every possible angle you can think of on these solutions. Um, and we really wanna be respectful of other groups. Um, be polite, leave the door open to further conversation. Um, we don't want to close down a conversation before you've even built up that trust there. And really, again, listen for the underlying concerns, identify them in the conversation, allow groups to be heard. Um, and like I said, pass those concerns along to me. I really, um, our DC office is really working to understand where those points of contention are and, and where the places are that we can work to either change the bill or expand it um, or answer questions about why there's misconceptions about it to other groups. And then just one last little topic is how can you help? So CCL National, uh, we work with pretty much every national organization. And if there's one that you think we should be doing outreach to, feel free to email me. Um, but there's no need for you to do outreach to the top, top policy people at any national organization. Um, if you do have a connection that you think is especially useful, please feel free to email me and we can coordinate um, an outreach plan together. But really, your efforts are going to be far more useful at the local level um, where a lot of these national groups have chapters that work at with the local member of Congress, they work with local business, um, and local groups tend to be far more movable than the national organizations. So you can talk about the bill with these groups, you don't necessarily need to get an endorsement. Like I said, um, 
getting a statement that even is supportive of bipartisan action, a statement of support where they say, I support this part of the bill, but I don't support this part of the bill. Um, that's totally fine. We can, we can use those. They're very helpful um, and they help members of Congress think through where the different um, groups of support are as well. Um, again, you can find out what changes a group would like to see in order to get on board with the policy. Maybe they say we'd, we'd wanna see X change and then we could sign on. Um, if you do find that out, please feel free to pass that on to me. Um, and then open the conversation up wider than carbon fees. You can talk about, or you should be asking them what they're working on and how we can be helpful. And uh, I find that at the local level, it's a lot easier to find those things to plug into. So this can either be, maybe you decide to do joint presentations where you're gonna just do basic climate education for um, the greater public in your local area or you can host a generic lobby training. Um, I've done a few of these, which are really great. Basically just helping groups think through, if you do wanna go meet with your member of Congress, what does that look like? How do you have a respectful meeting? Um, that's a really great resource that CCL has that we can offer to other groups without necessarily talking about the bill. And that way you can build up that trust and that respect with those groups um, so that they may be more inclined to listen when you talk about the bill. Um, and really just remembering that building up that trust at the local level is really going to go a long way, um, especially when there's groups that have chapters. If you have a great relationship with that local chapter, that gets back to their national groups. And that's who I'm working with and interfacing with. And the more they hear that we are helpful, that we're respectful, um, and that we're operating in good faith, that helps my conversations at the national level as well. Um, again, thank you so much for joining this call and for learning more about progressive outreach and all of the hard work that Stephanie does for our organization that's just so important. And if you did have any questions or wanted to follow up with her about anything that we've talked about today, you can reach her at stephanie at citizensclimate.org. So do go ahead and ask Stephanie if something pops up right after this. So thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day. Thanks very much. Thank you. That was helpful. Thank you. Thank you.